book of Genesis this morning. The title of my message is From Crisis to Caving In, Navigating End Time Economics. From Crisis to Caving In. Now, I am not an econ- economist nor the son of an economist, <laughs> uh, and yet I, I find myself being led uh, really for several weeks. I've been praying about this, and, and the Lord has been just... Uh, leading me in, in to, to, to say a few things about uh, what is happening uh, in the economy of our nation and, and how it affects you, how it affects our lives, how it affects our families, our homes. Uh, it's no secret that the economy of our land is in trouble. Amen? You can't be stepping into $20 trillion worth of debt and have no trouble, no matter how many coupons you've clipped. That's a problem, and uh, uh, I, uh, it affects our families, it affects our businesses, it affects, uh, it, it's going to affect everything, um, and, and uh, I was just uh, reading about uh, something on the internet about this. I'm holding a, a penny in my hand. You know how much it costs to make this penny? It costs two cents. To make a penny. And this is a nickel. You know how much it costs to make a nickel? Almost 11 cents to make a nickel. I know there's a lot of hand carving on each one. You know, I mean, I know they're, they're very expensive items to make, but the price to make them is going up all the time. How long can you do that? How long can you go? I mean, if it was the real, if the government lived in the real world, they'd be broke. Oh, wait a minute, they are. <laughs> $20 trillion broke. Uh, and uh, I know they're, you know they're a work of art and everything, but we, we, we can't do that very long. And something is coming and something is about to happen. And one thing that I do know about economics, whether it's parenting our children or, or helping the poor or uh, the economics of a nation is the best way, the best way to uh, help people in crisis is not to make them more dependent on whether it's yourself or whether it's the government or any other entity, not to make people more dependent, but to empower them to make good choices and to be wise in the times that they live in so that they use uh, whatever uh, resources they have wisely. Uh, and that's a challenge. That's hard work. It's a lot easier to just make more pennies and make more nickels no matter how much they cost. It's a lot easier to just crank out more than to be wise. And, uh, but I do know that the Lord is speaking to us. In Genesis chapter 41, there is a story about a crisis that happened 3,500 years ago. It happened in the nation of Egypt. Um, it was an economic crisis, and it speaks directly to where you and I are in the world in the 21st century. It has something profound to say to us, and I'm praying that the Lord is going to help us. And like I said, I can't even begin to scratch the surface of what I've been learning and, and studying and praying about and working on. So probably this fall, we'll do a, we'll do a series on, on Bible prophecy and some of these things in a little more depth. But this morning, I felt very strongly that I was supposed to talk about this uh, today. Um, the whole thing in Genesis 41 starts with a dream that the Pharaoh of the nation has. And it's a dream that he couldn't understand, and, and he called all of his sorcerers, and he called all of his soothsayers to come in and explain it to him. Explain this to me. And nobody could explain it. Uh, nobody understood or figured out what it was, and but somebody remembered that in one of Pharaoh's jails or prisons, there was, there was a young man, and he had power to interpret dreams. I think he was working with a baker at this time. Uh, and um, turns out, the young man just happened to be Joseph. Uh, Joseph was the son of Jacob. Jacob's name had been changed to Israel by God. That's another sermon. Uh, but at this time... Uh, 
there is no nation of Israel, but there is the seed of what will become the nation of Israel. And it turns out that this young man has, is connected to what, is going to what God is going to do in the very near future. And uh, Pharaoh calls Joseph uh, to him, and the Lord gives him the interpretation of the dream and says, uh, Pharaoh, uh, here's, here's what God is saying. You are going to have, uh, uh, you meaning Egypt, you're going to have seven years of unprecedented harvests, incredible wealth, incredible harvests are going to come in for the next seven years. And uh, there will be surplus every single year. Uh, but that is going to be, in today's economic terms, it would be called a, a, a grain bubble. We're going to have a grain bubble. And it's going to be awesome. And everybody's going to prosper. He said, but that bubble is going to burst. It's going to pop. It can't sustain itself forever, and it's going to be followed by seven years of famine, seven years when we won't have crops and uh, a famine that could devastate Egypt and the surrounding countries. And Pharaoh said, well, what should we do about this? And, and uh, uh, again, the Lord gives Joseph, this young man, a word of, uh, a word of wisdom and says, uh, well, here's the way to handle the next 14 years and, and make it. Here's the way to handle this upcoming thing and, and survive it. Um, what you need to do is during the seven good years, you need to store one-fifth of all the crops that come in. You need to put it away. You need to save it. One-fifth of everything that comes in, just save it. And that way, when the famine comes, Egypt will have grain. You'll be able to survive the lean years and you'll, you'll, you'll come through. You'll be all right. And Joseph said, or uh, the Pharaoh says to Joseph, sounds good to me, you're in charge. <laughs> that tends to happen when people have good ideas, they get put in charge. That's why when you come to Pastor Lee and say, Pastor Lee, I think we should do this, I say, you're in charge. That's what I do. <laughs> I learned that from Pharaoh. <laughs> he says, great idea. Joe, you take over, and, and, and he made him his second in command, his viceroy, uh, and makes him, uh, you know, and whatever Joseph says to do, that's what you guys need to do. Gave him the freedom to uh, ensure a future for Egypt, even though he wasn't an Egyptian. And just no charge for this. This isn't a part of my sermon, okay? So there's no, no cost involved here. But I think that's a great plan for every generation. I think it's a smart idea to save uh, uh, in the good times so that you're ready for the lean times. I think that's good, good sense. How many would agree with that? About half of you, yeah. Okay. 43, and if, probably if I had everybody in America would, to raise their hands, it would be about half. 43% of Americans have, uh, that are nearing retirement age have, about 20, have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. That's going to hurt. In fact, 27% of Americans approaching retirement years only have, have less than $1,000 saved for retirement. That's going to hurt. That's going to hurt. And the act is, well, the government will take care of me. And I'm not going to go there this morning. We, we won't, because it ain't. We, we got $20 trillion in debt. You think they're going to help you? I don't think so. What happens when the money's gone? What happens when the bubble bursts? That is the question that Egypt is about to deal with. And it is a question that you and I are about to deal with in this country uh, and in the world. This won't just happen in America. This is going to happen all across the world. Before we get into what happened in Egypt, it's very important to remember something as I go through this, this story. Egypt is not Israel. Turn to the person next to you and tell them that, just so we get it. Egypt is not, Israel, Egypt is not God's people, all right? So what's about to happen here is interesting, but it's important to remember that Egypt isn't Israel, Egypt isn't God's people, and Joseph has no responsibility towards this nation. 
God doesn't owe Egypt anything. In fact, Joseph, at this point in his life, is a slave to this Pharaoh. He owes him nothing. But there is this message that God wants us to hear from what happened to Egypt. And in one sense, this passage is a prophetic message to the world, to all of the nations of the world, nations that serve other gods, nations that have nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a message to the world system and where things will go. And uh, in other words, what I'm about to show you is what happens to people who don't understand or who were not willing to understand uh, economics from God's point of view, life and values from the living God, and instead do things their own way. What we're going to see is a cycle of crisis and caving in, crisis and caving, crisis and caving, and that has profound implications for our generation. It has prophetic implications for our generation, crisis and caving in. But along with this message uh, is the kingdom reason why Joseph, of all people, was pulled out of the bakery or yeah, you know, out of his servant mode, uh, a man who owes Egypt nothing to save this pagan nation. There is a kingdom reason for it. There is a, God has a plan for the reason why Joseph was pulled out of the ranks. Out of all the people that they, Joseph or Pharaoh could have found, here's this young, young boy. The kingdom reason is about preserving the lives of Joseph's family, his dad, Jacob, and his 11 brothers, who, by the way, got him in the mess in the first place. They're the reason why he is a slave in Egypt, by the way. So he doesn't know his brothers a whole lot either. But it's about preserving the lives of Jacob and his brothers, uh, Joseph's brothers, uh, because one day they are going to become the 12 tribes of Israel. These brothers of Joseph's are the patriarchs of Israel. And so what happens is, is, is really about that. These are God's people, and he is saving this nation, not for their sakes. He is saving this nation for this family, one family. That's why he's doing this. Uh, uh, Genesis 45, 7, Joseph says to his brothers, when he reveals himself to his brothers, God sent me before you to preserve you, uh, pr preserve for you a remnant in the earth and keep you alive by a great deliverance. This whole thing happened to keep you alive. That's what he says to his brothers. Israel wasn't a nation yet. Israel was a family. And God was about to protect an entire pagan nation through, uh, and, and walk them through a famine just to keep this little family and his plan alive. Isn't that incredible? And I tell you, God will do the same for you. God will say, do the same for you and your family and for the people of God, no matter what happens in this world in the years to come. We need to understand the times that we live in. We need to be wise in the times that we live in. But God is going to preserve you in these times. Amen? It doesn't mean that you can live foolishly. It doesn't mean that you can be foolish with your money, foolish with your time, foolish with your relationship. We have to be wise as serpents, Jesus said, and harmless as what? Doves. We, we need to know what's going on. We need to be able to navigate this time. But the, 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 the divine plan is going to go on, and you, you are a part of that divine plan. Hallelujah? Isn't that awesome to think about? You are a part of a divine plan. A smoking flax, the prophet said, God will not put out. And right now, we're a smoking flax as a nation. But he is going to keep us through that time, and he will, do, he will do it because he loves us, because we are the family of God. And we need to remember this as we go into what happens in this story, 
in order to really understand it because when you look at it just from face value, we think, boy, Joseph, you're a, you're a turkey. You're not a very nice person. But we need to understand the kingdom perspective. Um, and the kingdom perspective, first and foremost, is that God will take care of his people. Amen? Hallelujah. Turn to the person next to you and tell them that. God's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. So it starts to happen. Joe's in charge now, and the first seven years uh, go really well. Um, everything that Joseph said uh, would happen does happen, and there is incredible prosperity in Egypt, and, and uh, it is amazing. And so 20% of the harvest, just like he said, uh, are being stored up. They're being saved. Uh, the people still had 80% to live on, and that's pretty amazing. Uh, and so this seven years of plenty, things were going great. Gen uh, verse 49 of Genesis 41 says, Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea. That's a lot of grain. Until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. We have so much surplus, it's just, I, we don't even have to count it anymore. We're, we're building grain bins everywhere. When I, I worked my way through college um, building grain bins on the concrete floors for grain bins. And man, when you had a good harvest, farmers were building grain bins like crazy to store it all. And this is what was going on here. They were pouring car concrete and putting up those metal sheds all over Egypt um, for all the grain. It was incredible. And uh, uh, he says, thus Joseph stored up the grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it for it was beyond measure. But... The day came when the crops died. The day, just as God told uh, Joseph, just as Pharaoh's dream uh, showed, the rain stopped. The people used up their 80% of grain, and the famine hit. Verse 55 says, So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, and whatever he tells you to do, do it. Well, that sounds familiar. Maybe that's where Mary got that phrase with Jesus. Just whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And when the famine was spread over all of the face of the earth, Joseph opened all the storehouses and, listen, and sold the grain to the Egyptians. So, now, wait a minute. That's not how it's supposed to work. We're supposed to get it for nothing, right? We're supposed to get it for free. What do you mean we have to pay for it? Yeah, we do. That's important. I, I want to think about that for a minute because he, Joseph doesn't just give away the grain. Okay, famine's here. Open up all the grain bins and come on and get it. It's all free. Just come get what you want. How long do you think that would last if, if Joseph had done that? How long would that grain? I mean, if they used up 80% of their grain in seven years, how long do you think it would take to, to use up 20%? I mean, it would be gone in less than a year. I mean, people would just go crazy getting all the free stuff and, and hoarding it to themselves and fighting over it. And uh, he doesn't just give it away. It's not a government welfare program, just free food for anybody who wants it. That would have made Joseph popular, but the re reserves would have been gone, I think, within months. It, it would have been gone. It would have been gone. And the Egyptian pennies would be costing two cents to make. Oh, wait a minute. That's where we are. If they used up grain that quickly, uh, it wouldn't last a year. So selling the grain, understand Selling the grain forced people to make choices. It forced them to make choices about what was important, about what was a need and what was a want. In times of plenty, they just went through their grain like nobody's business. They used up 80% of incredible harvests. They used it all up in seven years, and now they're facing seven years. Everybody knew that there was going to be a seven-year famine. It wasn't kept in a secret. They knew that they were saving for that time. And now it was time to make some hard decisions. 
They should have been making decisions back then, but the only way they did was that Joseph was the one who imposed the 20%. And now they've got to make decisions about what's a need and what's a want in terms of their life. Verse 57 says, the people of all the earth, the then known land, came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was so severe. And here's the question that this passage calls every person and every nation to think about and answer. What will people give up in a crisis? What will people give up in a crisis? I want you to tell me, as I read through what Joseph does here and what the people do, tell me if this doesn't sound like our world today. Genesis chapter 47 is where we see how Joseph uh, distributes the 20% surpluses, or the grain during this time. Verse 13 says uh, of Genesis 47, now there was no food in all the land because the famine was very severe so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. What's the use of money if we don't have any food? Uh, Take our money. Just give us grain. Just give us food. And so personal, now watch this, personal income is now under control of the government. That's what just happened. All of the money of the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan goes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh now takes care of the people's food needs. Isn't that something? It's interesting that in the United States, there are half the number of banks there used to be less than a decade ago. Where'd all the money go? Well, and I'm, like I say, I'm no economist, but just, just, I'm just a rodeo cowboy that's been kicked in the head a few times, and even I can figure out there's something going on. Where'd the money go? Here, in this passage of Scripture, all of the money is now under the control of Pharaoh. Interesting. Well, it goes on, verse 15. When all the money was spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. For why should we die in your presence? For our money is gone. Mm. And Joseph said, Give up your livestock, and I'll give you food for your livestock, for your livestock since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys. And he fed them with food in the exchange for all, uh, in exchange for all of their livestock that year. What does that sound like? I understand livestock at this time in, in, in this culture uh, is what businesses would be in our culture. Your livestock wasn't just, you know, these weren't hobby farms. Your livestock was how you made your living. It was, it, was, uh, it was hides, and it was milk, and it was meat, and it was transportation. But what good is livestock if you don't have the grain to feed them? And so for grain, people would give up their means of making a living, and now The means for making a living is under the control of the government. First all the money, and now all the businesses. Does that sound like any place you know? I remember just a few years ago, government regulations almost destroyed our automobile uh, industry. So much so that they began to Collapse, but of course they're too big to fail, so the government swooped in, and our own president was the CEO of GM Motors for a while in, on paper. The government owned the, end of the car industry. What will people give up in a crisis? 
what's going on in our land? Verse 18, uh, when that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. My Lord, meaning Joseph, our boss, you know, you're the guy in charge. Uh, that our money is all spent, our cattle, uh, it all belongs to you now. There's nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes before we both, uh, uh, wait a minute, why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. Money, livestock, land, and now the people even offer themselves as slaves to the government. Just take care of us. Is this too depressing? Are you guys getting depressed? Pastor, you're bumming me out, man. I, <laughs> I, it'll get better, I promise. But, but I love you and I promise I always, always teach you the truth. But here's the message of this passage for the nations. Now remember, I tried to set this up. This is a message to the nations. Joseph doesn't owe Egypt anything. This isn't, Egypt isn't the children of God. This isn't about a covenant. This is about the world. And this is about the way things are in this nation as we drift further and further away from God. We are falling into this very same pattern that Egypt was in 3,500 years ago. That's where we're headed. This is for people who choose to disregard the ways of the Lord. This is for Christians who feel like God's ways aren't good enough. I've got a better way of figuring out my money and how I'm going to live and what I'm going to do. This is for those kind of folks. Desperate people will give away their lives to anyone who has an answer to their crisis. Um, I might have a job tomorrow. <sighs> and beloved, this story is a warning that the crisis of our day and the freedoms and the controls that we are so willingly giving away in our culture to solve the crises that we have are preparing the nation. And I say this just with just prophetic. This is what the Bible says. This is where we are headed is preparing us for a coming centralized government, for a coming centralized economy, for a coming centralized religion. The prophet Daniel talks about it. Jesus Christ talks about it. The apostle Paul talks about it. The apostle John the Revelator talks about it. They all predict a world leader, a world antichrist, a man empowered by Satan who will resolve all of our societal ills, who will just magically bring peace to the Middle East, who will do amazing things and be loved and even worshipped by the world as he takes away every last vestige of freedom from every nation on this planet. The Bible teaches. And that's where the world is going. It's where Egypt went. That's why they're not a world, they weren't a world power. They still aren't a world power. I've often wondered, how in the world could 21st century people, I mean, 21st century people are cynical. Uh, we're sometimes sophisticated. And more often, we're just plain stubborn, rebellious. How could people like that get to a point where they could, where they could literally worship a man where they could literally uh, let a man rise to such power that people from every nation, every culture, every religious background just worship him and willingly take the mark of his name into their hand. Or on, how could that happen? Where you'd say, yeah, I'll take, the, I'll take the mark if that's what I need to do. I mean, that's great. It's, it, I'll do that. I'll do that. 
I'll gladly or even I'll grudgingly sell him my allegiance as long as I get my grain this month. As long as I get my grain this month. It seems impossible to me that people could get there. And, and the question that I thought about and read, are people really so easily deceived? And the answer is no. People aren't that stupid. But, but, and that's why the warning is here in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Like the Egyptians, this thing doesn't happen in a moment. It's a cycle of crisis and caving, crisis and caving, crisis and caving over years of time, and it creates over crisis and caving and bailouts and dependency and crisis and caving and bailouts and dependency and bailouts and dependency over and over until in our culture today, we are being desensitized in preparation for that day. When a man could come onto the world scene and have that kind of allegiance because of what's happening in every nation right now. Crisis, crisis and caving and bailout and dependency. And that's the age that you and I live in. As we look at our nation, we look at our economy, we look at our culture, you can't help but notice that wealth and power, whether it's industry or decision-making, even law in our nation especially, law, is being taken out of more and more hands and placed into fewer and fewer hands. We see that over and over and over again in our own culture. Watch what's going on in the elections. That law just, you know, is different for different people. That's the way our world is right now. And this cycle, as it goes on, a spirit of dependency and a spirit of entitlement in our culture says, well, you can have it all as long as you're taking care of me. You know, I really don't care about those stupid politicians in Washington as long as I get my bag of grain at the end of the month. And, 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 and I, I share this with you because I love you. And this is where we're going. Um, Dr. David Jeremiah calls this phenomenon uh, sacrificing tomorrow on the altar of today. Sacrificing your tomorrow on the altar of today. This is a book that he wrote, and I highly recommend it. It's called The Coming Economic Armageddon by Dr. David Jeremiah. Uh, It'd be a good one for you to read. I'm still, like I said, I'm not an economist. I I am dumb when it comes to this stuff. But I'm learning. I'm learning things, and I'm I'm wanting to be able to process a lot of things and then bring it uh, to to us so that as we go through... uh, these last days that we are prepared, that we know what's going on. And this is a part of it. And something that Dr. Jeremiah says in his book is, we as a nation are relying increasingly on the government for our income, financial security, rescue from imprudent business decisions, and now even our health care. With each of these dependencies, we are giving up basic freedoms and risk selling ourselves to the unscrupulous pharaohs of the world. What are people willing to give up in a crisis? That's the question for the world today. I remember when we served as missionaries in the former Soviet Union, 72 years of communism. And I would sit with elderly men, even pastors uh, and, and women in that part of the world, in Russia and in Siberia, in Ukraine, in Belarus, and in many places. And they would long for the return of the days of Lenin and Stalin. They wish those days would come back. And as an American, I think, are you crazy? Have you, do you know your own history? Do you know what Stalin did? You know, we think Hitler's terrible for killing 6 million Jews. Stalin, our ally, killed 16 million Jews in his own country. Are you nuts? And yet the, here's what they would say over and over again. Jana heard this. They'd say, yes, they were... They were tyrants, they exploited us, they controlled everything, they were, com- they were cruel beyond words. A million of us died at their hands, yes, but, they would say, at least under communism, we had bread. At least under communism, we had bread. And a discussion. 
Decades of crisis and caving leaves a nation hopeless, leaves it helpless, it leaves us ready for a new world order. And that's exactly what Lenin promised Russia. It's exactly what Stalin promised Russia, a new world order. It's exactly what Hitler promised Germany, a new world order. And we are being promised the same thing in this country. The Bible says after seven years, the famine came to an end and Egypt is now the most powerful nation on earth. They weren't then, before Joseph got a hold of them. But now, the Pharaoh, and he's a benevolent man, he's not evil, he's a benevolent man, he's a leader and a ruler and he wanted to take care of his people, but now he is the most powerful man on earth. And the Egyptian people go back to work at the end of the uh, famine. Uh, verse 23, Joseph said to the people, behold, I have today brought you, uh, bought for you your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you and you may sow the land. At the harvest, you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh and four fifths you shall, shall be your own for the seed of the field and for your food and for those of your household and for the food for your little ones. So at the end of the thing, in terms of Egypt, in terms of this uh, culture that isn't the people of God, what happens is now the government owns everything, but the government gives people seed so that they can grow crops. All we ask of you is a 20% tax, just like the, the seven years of plenty, just a 20% tax. Now, that's a pretty good deal, really. I mean, that's better than we get. <laughs> I mean, the average Minnesotan, we work from January to May to pay our taxes, isn't that true? And so they didn't work that long. 20% tax and you guys are... So that was the... Okay, for them, that's it. But the kingdom principle here, most importantly, for the kingdom of God, Jacob's sons, Joseph's brothers, and their family survived the, nation, uh, the famine and began to flourish during this time. Verse 27 says, now Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it, and they were fruitful, and they became very numerous, and during this time, the Hebrew nation is born. It's no longer a little family, it is now a nation. And though later on Israel would become enslaved by the pharaohs, uh, uh, Exodus 1.8 there's just this ominous verse that says, a new Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph. And all bets were off. Everything changed. And the Hebrews who were once just a part of the Egyptian civilization became the slaves of the Egyptian civilization. And so God sent them another savior. God sent them Moses, who delivered them out of Egypt and into the land that God had promised Abraham. So that's, in terms of why did God allow this to happen, what was going on, those are the two tracks. Egypt goes this direction and becomes dependent on its government and is ultimately destroyed by the hand of God, saved at this point, but destroyed by the hand of God under the power of, and the leadership of Moses. And the Hebrew nation is born and then brought into the promised land out of this. Because no matter what happens in the nations, no matter who rises, no matter who falls, God will always take care of his people. Amen? God will always take care of his people. And we've got to draw close to him. Hallelujah? If you don't get anything else out of this message, just know we've got to stay close to the Lord. Oh, I've got a moving pulpit here, so I can't, I can't pound it like the wood one. But uh, that's, that's important. So now, what's the message for you and me today? We just kind of bring this down to, you know, that was kind of macroeconomics and, and macro nations. What about you? What about, where do we stand in a culture as Christians? Where do we stand in a culture that's being manipulated the way, the way Egypt went? The way other nations have went? Greece went through this not long ago. Greece was totally, uh, I won't go into it, but what, what do we do about this cycle of crisis and caving in and getting more and more dependent? What do we do? 
Well, I want to give you just, a, uh, just four very brief things. Number one, resist the poverty mentality that sacrifices your tomorrow on the altar of today. Resist that with everything that's in you. Resist sacrificing tomorrow on the altar of today. People are easily manipulated when they have no self-control, when they don't plan, when they don't save, when they live in the moment with no reflection on outcomes, no reflection on consequences. People are easily, easily manipulated when that's the way they live their lives. Well, you just go from crisis to crisis, and so it's easy to create a crisis. In fact, one of our government leaders said, "Never, <laughs> boy, never, never miss a crisis. Don't let a crisis go by because it's a chance to manipulate the people. He said that on the news. My goodness. My goodness. But it happens when people don't, when, when they live in this life of sacrificing tomorrow to be happy today. And you are God's people. And the word of the Lord to you is don't go there. Don't live that way. You are not that guy. You're not that woman. The book of Proverbs uh, 27, 12 says, a wise man or a wise woman watches for what lies ahead and prepares to meet it. A simpleton never looks ahead and suffers the consequences. Number two, do not be deceived. That's why I try my best to teach the truth here, you guys. I don't want you to be deceived. 80 times in the Bible, God warns us, stay awake, do not be deceived, stay awake, keep your eyes open. He says in Colossians 2.8, beware lest anyone spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ, know the Lord, walk with Jesus, do not be deceived. Don't turn to the right or to the left, continue to walk with God. Now more than ever, we need to be people of prayer. We need to be people of this book. We need to be people who know the Lord, and we know the times, and we understand what to do in them. We, have to, we know God's voice, and we're able to discern the voices of others and, as counterfeits and drop them like a hot potato. Amen? We've just got to be there. We've got to be there. We need to be people who walk in the Word and obey the Word because it'll keep us from falling. It'll keep us from caving in a crisis. The only thing that'll keep us is the power of God. And what he does is he keeps us from caving in a crisis. He says, well, how are we going to have grain if we don't do what the world says? God will take care of his people. Amen? He will make a way where there seems not to be a way. It's what he does. Who he is. Hallelujah. Stay faithful and don't be deceived. Number three, let the peace of God rule your heart. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of God rule your heart. People, who are, people are easily manipulated if they're angry. If you have an anger problem, get help. We're here to help you. We love you. We'll help you. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to live in that. Uh, we have a ministry called Celebrate Recovery that helps folks with that. We have counseling ministers that help you with that. We don't want you to live angry because when you're angry, you're easily manipulated. You're easily led down a road to destruction. It's just the way it is. And so if you suffer from a spirit of ang anger, let Christ deliver you and set you free and let the peace of God rule your heart. Worldlings rush in anger from crisis. All these crowds that we see blocking Highway 35 and all this stuff, you know what's going on? It's angry people. It's angry people, and those kind of folks are easily misled. But Jesus said, my peace I give to you. And when you have peace, your eyes are wide open. Hallelujah. When you have peace, your eyes are wide open. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Hallelujah. And number four, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Turn to the person next to you right now, don't be afraid. In fact, you know what? It's really interesting. That phrase, do not be afraid, fret not thyself, in King James, that's the way I memorized it, fret not thyself, 365 times in the Bible. One for every day of the year. 
don't be afraid. I said, we're so dumb, we got to get one every day. Okay, don't be afraid. Okay, but, but do you hear, did you hear what's on the news? Don't be afraid. Yeah, but did you see who's, what they said now? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. But, but, but Hillary is saying that don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Let not your, tr- your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. You're not a worldling. You're not. You're an alien. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, you alien, you alien, you don't belong here. The Antichrist will come. We know it because the prophecy of this book says that it will, and everything that happens, everything that this book says either has happened or will happen in terms of prophecy, just the way it is. But we are not looking for the Antichrist. We are looking for the Christ. Amen? I, I, we're not digging, oh, could it be him? Could it be him? Whose number adds up to, whose name adds up to 66? Don't get into that stuff. I think uh, Billy Graham's mom's name added up to 666. <laughs> so don't go there, all that dumb stuff. We're looking for Jesus, and he's with us now. And he is coming back. And in the meantime, the scripture warns us, the spirit of Antichrist, you don't have to look for him, it's already at work in the world. Paul said that 2,000 years ago to the Thessalonians. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work. And we see it. I just, I just showed you. It's been at work clear back in Genesis it was at work. Wages losing their value. Violence in the streets. Few, uh, uh, fewer haves and more and more have-nots. Wars and rumors of wars, false Christs, false doctrine, cycle after cycle of of crisis and caving. It's all a society that is being driven towards a rigged system, and we're not going to change the system. It's not going to change. It is the world, and the world is under a curse. The only thing that changes is you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Repent of your sins and draw close to Christ and he will save you of your sins and he will draw close to you and he will keep you from falling. Hallelujah. That's where we go. That's where we go. When you see these things, Jesus said, do not be afraid, one of the 365 times. Be wise. These things must come. But look up. Because it means your redemption is on its way. Hallelujah. Your redemption is on its way. Thank you, Lord. Would you stand with me this morning? And would you just uh, find someone around you and say, Jesus is coming. Tell them, Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. And you and I, as God's people, need to be willing to pray the price, to be people of the word and people of prayer who draw close to God because the only thing that's going to get us through the days and the weeks and the years to come is your relationship with the King of Kings and the God of Gods and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Do not be afraid. The end of the book says, listen, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Amen? That's what's going to happen. And so we have to be wise and walk with Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that all the way back in the very first book of the Bible, you were talking to us about what happens when a world just goes off course and lives crisis after crisis. You showed us, O oh Lord, that how willing people are to give up their freedom and their life for the sake of a bag of grain at the end of the month. But out of the same inspiration, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. You are our source. Jesus, you said, I am the way the truth, and the life. You didn't say, I'll show you the way. You didn't say, I'll uncover some hints about the way. You said, I am the way. 
And so I pray for every person in this room and every family that they represent. That just like you covered this family of Jacob with your hand during this time of famine and darkness, God, would you cover the families of this body of believers? Would you cover us and keep us? Would you convict us, O oh Lord, where we have taken things into our own hands and tried to do it on our own? And if there's going to be any dependency going on in this congregation, let it be dependency on the Holy Spirit. Let it be dependency on Jesus. Let it be heavily, heavily leaning on a living God who loves us and has a plan and a future for us. Oh God, we realize that, that things are wrapping up. We, we can't help but notice God, you would give us wisdom and you would give us strength and you would give us tenacity, a holy tenacity to navigate these days without caving in. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would put steel in the heart of every person in this room and that we would be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And we would not be deceived. We would not believe the lies, but we would know the truth and stay free. I pray for blessing. I pray for providence. I pray for protection and healing and grace upon your people. Because if we can't learn anything else from this story, we can learn one thing. God takes care of his people. And Lord, this room is full of your people. And so, Jesus, keep us. In your mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I love you guys. Go out there and live and serve the Lord and be strong. Hallelujah.